Hi, I'm Mina Malik Hussain and this is The Coffee Table. And as always, we've got a wonderful show lined up for you today. And I'm particularly excited to be in my Ajak today because today we are talking all things South Punjab and we're talking about Saraiki language and culture. And I'm very excited about all the learning that I anticipate happening today on the show. <laughs> so it is my great privilege to be welcoming three stalwarts of the Saraiki culture and language and literary scene and it's just really lovely and I'm really excited, even though they're not with me in person today. So, kicking things off, we've got Nawab Hassan Hussain Qureshi joining us today. He is a digital consultant, a sports analyst, and an agriculturalist from Multan. He is a member of the South Punjab Cricket Association and is also responsible for Pakistan's first Saraiki podcast called Saraikast. We are also joined by our great pal of the coffee table, Meher F. Hussain, who is a journalist, author, and publisher based in Lahore. She also works as a media consultant. Uh, she also works with the Taj Muhammad Langa Saraiki Archive. And our third guest today is the distinguished Dr. Nukpa Taj Langa. She is an academic and an activist. Currently, she is an associate professor of English at Foreman Christian College here in Lahore, where she has served since 2009 as faculty, chair of English, and dean of humanities. Her academic work has a focus on Saraiki resistance literature and South Asian literature. And as an activist, Dr. Langa is the chair of the Pakistani Saraiki Party that was established by her father, barrister Taj Muhammad Langa. And she is also the guiding light behind the Taj Muhammad Langa Saraiki Archive, which we are going to be talking about today. Welcome to the show, all three of you. Huzzah! So I want to start at the very beginning with a sort of very basic, almost idiotic question. And I want, Hassan, I want you to answer this, is that when we talk about South Punjab, where, what regions are we looking at? What, what city are we looking at? Uh, thank you so much, Minna, for having me on. Uh, for people, South Punjab kind of breaks down into two regions. Mm -hmm. Some people look at it administratively. So they're yeah. like, okay, this is where the boundary starts. Mm. And then, you know, they bring in sort of the Bahawalpur division, the Multan division, the Dera Ghazi Khan division. Yeah. That's how people define it administratively. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit different when you describe it in terms of linguistics, in terms of demographics, hmm. because for people, it starts somewhere just, uh, and again, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. I'm just going with, with what I've learned over the years. So as you so, sort of cross towards Multan, hmm. for the people of the region, the Siraiki belt goes all the way into Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, hmm. into Dera Ismail Khan. Hmm. It's a Siraiki speaking city. It's very much part of our Was Waseb, we call it, which is our yeah. culture. Huh. It's very much part of, you know, what we see it goes into parts of Balochistan mm. that border Dera Ghazi Khan mm. and then of mm. course it goes into parts of Sindh Satkabad right. till where in Sindh a lot of people also identify with Siraiki mm. they speak the language yeah. so how people see it administratively geographically and how we see it might differ but mm. that's generally sort of the gist of it Right. And I think that that's an important distinction to make, because when we're looking at a uh, Saraiki culture, then we are clearly looking at a very broad sw swathe, swathe of the country where people uh, identify as Saraiki because of a shared language and because of a shared cultural experience that really bands them together. And I think that traditionally, a lot of people think of Saraiki culture as Multan, Bahawalpur based mostly. But, you know, things like thinking about it in terms of, you know, uh, D.I. Khan, for example, I think a lot of people don't consider that traditionally a Siraiki sort of cultural area, but it is. And I think it's really interesting to think about it in those uh, in those terms. So, Hassan, uh, you have set up this wonderful podcast called Siraikast, and it is a podcast that you conduct in Siraiki. So what motivated you to do this? Like, why a podcast? And what was the need that you felt the, the podcast is addressing? I mean, I felt that there wasn't enough content. You know, I, mm -hmm. I got a bit annoyed with constantly seeing the same sort of content around the lines of funny Siraiki joke. Yeah. And then, you know, there'd be someone on talking about something which didn't even relate to the culture. Mm -hmm. And I felt that there was a, a real interest. I felt that people wanted, I'm seeing young people now mm -hmm. digitally online, especially mm -hmm. on, on social media platforms, mm -hmm. take a lot of interest in their language, take a lot of interest in their culture and their history and promoting it. But every time they try and talk about it, someone would connect them with something from, uh, you know, uh, YouTube or something. Oh, look, here's a couple of funny Multanis having a chat about 
something. And in a way, even though if they didn't mean it to be, it hmm. was degrading. Yes. Uh, I, I, I put this uh, idea out on um, Twitter and it took Meher all of 22 seconds to convince <laughs> me and, you know, get it started and up and running. And literally everyone who's been on the show is because of uh, the, the amount of work that Meher has put in. It would be very unfair for me alone to take the credit. And it's just been great. The response from people has yeah. been wonderful. The We've had people on and I've had people writing to me and saying, oh, I didn't know someone like Aves Khan, who's a fantastic author yeah. and has written a brilliant book in English, is Siraiki. And there's the two yeah. of us sitting there talking in Siraiki. And then, you know, we, we spoke to people who, who work for the government. We spoke to people who are entrepreneurs. Huh. We spoke to people who are archivists. And suddenly, everyone's sort of turning around and saying, oh, OK, I thought everybody, and they don't mean this disparagingly, yes. but a lot of people's idea of Siraiki speakers is, oh, the people who work as laborers mm -hmm. in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. or the people who work in, in that class, mm -hmm. uh, sort of like, you know, blue collar jobs in, in the Gulf or places like that. Yeah. And then people connected with me. There's a gentleman I'm hoping to talk to soon who runs a Siraiki language channel in Australia. And everywhere he goes, he documents everything in Siraiki, and it's fantastic. Wow. I've gotten in touch with people from India who have now kept the language alive for the yes. fourth generation. You know, wow. they're passing the language uh. down. They, they hold on. When I went to India in 2013, uh, a lot of people would come up to me and say, you know, my name is something, something Multani or something, uh. something Bahawalpuri. They yes. took the name of their cities. They said it's the huh. only way to hold on to our, our culture and our heritage. Huh. So it was. I felt it was important. And then the response has been great. And the young ones, it's really for the young ones. I'm hoping someone, you know, better than myself will come along and take it along. Also, I noticed, uh, Mina, that a lot of people now have access to social media. Yes. Uh, in my village, everybody mm. has a smartphone. Everybody. Yes. So suddenly they're looking at this YouTube stuff. They're sending me. They're like, oh, wow, you're talking to Meher Bibi and you guys are talking about these things. Meher and I did a talk on um, uh, Aurat March, which I don't yeah. think anybody in Siraiki had broached before. It's very important Absolutely. to talk ah, about ah. current day problems and current day uh, issues and news, yeah. but updating it in, a, in, the, in the kind of language that the layman and especially the laywoman can understand. Absolutely. I think that that's crucial. And hi, Meher, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Unfortunately, Welcome. my internet is stopping. Of the internet, you know, this, this is like the main thing that we're always on tenter hooks with, with Zoom guests, is that please, internet gods, smile upon us. <laughs> so, Mehr, um, tell me more about how um, increased access to the internet and an increased awareness amongst younger people has, do you feel like these things are leading to, let's say, would it be extravagant to say that there is a sort of a resurgence of pride in Siraiki culture or a sort of Siraiki renaissance happening because people are able to connect and there are initiatives like Hassan's podcast and the work that the archive is doing to connect people and to connect Siraiki culture with the people who live it? Absolutely, Mina. Um, first of all, I'd like to credit um, Nawab Hassan for taking the initiative and honestly, all credit goes to him and, of course, Dr. Langa for what they're doing for the Saraiki people. Because, yes, the, the, this digital realm is revolutionizing not just concepts of identity, but also the rural economy. Mm. So you have people, for example, in job, you know, rural artisans, particularly female ones, who are now running their e-shops. Yes. And they're selling their craft directly and they're earning directly. Mm. On top of that, on the male side, there's a lot more awareness about who they are. For example, mm. I'm sure Dr. Langar can expand on this, but if you go down to these areas and you ask people, mm. okay, what are you in terms of your identity? Mm. Who do you identify mm. as? They will always say, we're Saraiki. Yes. And you see, it's interesting to see these concepts coming about because you see, as um, Nawab Hassan very correctly said, that people have access. Everyone has a smartphone. Mm. They may still be living in, in rural areas, in, mm. in, in the you know, old homes, but they, mm. they are certainly navigating Facebook. And they yes. see conversations happening around Urdu, they see conversations happening around Punjabi yes. and other regional languages. Mm. And there's mm. this awareness that, well, hang on a second, what are we doing? Huh. Let's not forget that the Saraiki people are an ethno-linguistic group in South Punjab. You know, this is an area that, is an amalgamation of the Indus Valley civilization and various other religions. Yeah. Nowhere else will you see some place 
where you have a Hindu or a Sikh majority as there was in South Punjab. Yes. And so now with this digital realm and people connecting, and you have, of course, Facebook groups, for example, mm. the Taj Langa mm. Saraiki Archive, and there are many others pertaining to Punjabi culture. People are coming forth and sharing images and sharing histories and sharing thoughts. And I do feel that the Saraiki region has a very young population that is rising. Mm. And they want mm. to be heard. They want yes. to be seen. They want to be recognized mm. in various forms, not just politically, yes. but yes. even via craft. For example, mm. Rizwan Big, the fashion designer, received an award mm -hmm. for his work pertaining to fashion. Yes. Interestingly, his entire brand is built up on the work of South Punjab female artisans. Yeah. The Tarkashi work, the embroidery work, the shadow work, mm. all of it is done by them. Mm. And I can see when I interact with these women, they talk about wanting recognition as well. Yes. So, yes, I do feel that the digital realm is where change is happening. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Langa, what do you think has facilitated or catalyzed this increasing desire in younger, especially in younger Saraiki kiddos, who wants to reclaim their, their Saraiki identity. So do you feel like there's been a shift in maybe the past decade or so that has sort of inspired the younger generation to reclaim their Saraiki identity and to recognize that this is a very important part of who they are and how they perceive themselves? Uh, thank you, Mina. Um, I think it's uh, the, the shift is uh, we've been in the process, but this has not happened. Um, uh, unfortunately, I feel the shift is not as fast as we expected, right? Mm. Because mm. in my view, the because I interact with people in Punjab and I people yes. I interact with people in Saraiki Vase. Mm. Sorry, I'm not going to use the term South Punjab because we regard it as a derogatory term. Oh, um, I'm sorry, so, I did not know that. <laughs> See? Learning. <laughs> I we've intentionally decided that we are not going to use the term South Punjab because yes. we are Saraikis and yes. of course, you know, this is Saraiki region. Hmm. And so, like Hassan said, uh, the region is is much sort of broader than what we think of it geographically. So in, in a way, it makes a lot of sense to just say Saraiki Vaseb instead of South Punjab. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in my view, because I interact with people in Punjab and Saraiki Vaseb, yes. I feel that uh, although they have access to digital media, mm -hmm. they're using mm -hmm. Facebook and WhatsApp, but they, are, they have so many groups, Mina, I can't mm -hmm. tell you. I'm part of so many groups huh. that my phone huh. is virtually stuck and I don't know where to start removing data from it. So the discussions are there, but huh. I feel that you know, we don't have, uh, like, that was one reason of uh, considering uh, Taj Langa Digital Archive, because mm -hmm. we need organized platforms, you know, yes. digital platforms, which mm -hmm. are not only initiating debates mm -hmm. uh, and discussions, but also promoting research on Saraiki, promo pro promoting artisans and artwork, yes. and talking about preserving the uh, historical docu documents or monuments. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And, and for me, uh, I observe one more problem that mm. the discussions on Saraiki culture, identity, Vaseb, they they somehow become limited within the their own circles, right? right. Within their own mm. intellectual mm. circles. Right. So I, I, I think Nawab Saab and Meher are doing a wonderful job because they are kind of uh, crossing, creating transnational forums right yes. but the thing is our people Saraiki people have to get used to it and they have they are not used to it unfortunately mm -hmm. perhaps researchers and universities or professors are but not uh, common mm -hmm. people or masses so right exactly so that exposure in my view is very important but mm -hmm. I mean, we are trying collectively, yes. uh, even if we are not working yes. on same projects, but yes. all three of us here yes. are trying different things in different manners. Absolutely. But it, Absolutely. I think the changes, in my view, the changes has been very slow, 
but I uh, we have to thank the COVID in one way because they <laughs> due to COVID situation we are totally dependent on technology and we are thinking of new ways of using technology positively. Absolutely, so, and I, and that kind of ease of access has change. also changed. Yes, and ease of access has also changed. Where you know now we can talk to each other with sort of it, it's become easier in many ways to connect with, uh, let's say, you know, Saraiki people across the border, Saraiki people around the world. And in a way, yeah, I, I see what you mean. We're going to take a very quick break here and we'll be back in a flash. Stay with us. Welcome back to this riveting conversation about Saraiki culture and language that we're having with Nawab Hassan Hussain Qureshi, Meher F. Hussain, and Dr. Nukhba Taj Langa. So um, before the break, we were um, talking about several things, but now I want to kind of cycle around to language, which is a very sort of key aspect of identifying as um, Saraiki. So um, Dr. Langa, can you tell me a little bit more about the archive because and the work that the archive has set out to do? Yes. Um, the archive, I've been thinking since since my father passed away in 2013 and, you know, he's, he's spent at least um, four dec decades uh, in, in uh, fighting and struggling for the Saraiki people's rights and identity. And he's left a lot of documentation and mm. of course, which is kind of our personal asset as well. And, yes. you know, I've been thinking that there should be a location where we could preserve them and, you know, mm. kind of introduce his work and everything. Because sometimes researchers also come to us if you're if they're working on Saraiki movement, they come to us and they, they, they want to talk about, you know, collecting speeches, collecting mm. pamphlets, mm. you know, political mm. literature. Quite so right. that was that, that's something that I had been thinking all along. Mm -hmm. But as I told you, because of the digital, the enhancement of reliance on uh, digital mm -hmm. media, um, and I also met, um, uh, I was introduced to Nawab Hassan Saab and Meher um, through common friends. So we we had several discussions over the period of past few months. And Taj Langa Archive is actually, I dedicated the title, the name of the archive to my father because of his uh, commitment with the Saraiki people yeah. and his work until his last day of his life. Um, but it does not mean that it is only looking for, uh, you know, uh, or preserving things just based on his work. Yes. Uh, what we are trying to do is kind of cre create a forum where we could, it, it, it is like gen uh, generating a new kind of discourse, which is broader and mm. beyond the Saraiki shape. And, you know, where people, most of the time you think that, uh, you know, uh, within local politics, people are, uh, although they're working towards the Saraiki cause, but perhaps... Uh, leg pulling is going on or yes. criticism, self-criticism is going on. So this is a, something beyond it because in Quite my right. view, it is, uh, it, this, this, this is a kind of an unbiased uh, initiative yes. where people from any political uh, faction mm. or any mm. part of Pakistan or beyond Pakistan who are working on, who are interested Absolutely. in empowering huh. and promoting Thing, yes. Saraiki language, culture, and that, identity. That's a very crucial. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's a it crucial um, distinction to make. That the archive is an academically, um, it, the intention is an academic one, and a, and something uh, in a, and a pres the the idea, the thrust of it is preservation and enhancement. And it's really important to be able to have a, a resource like this where people have access because a lot of academic work is dependent on having access to papers and to literature and writing, which then and otherwise would be lost. And I think that this, it's really exciting. It's really exciting to hear. And Meher, tell me more about the outreach work that the archive is doing as well, because I know that you had a series of, of really informative, wonderful talks looking at various aspects of preserving Saraiki language and literature as well. Absolutely, Meher. 
I think one of the things um, I must commend Dr. Lagar is her openness to what will constitute the archives library. And I do feel that there are many areas pertaining to the literature in the Sarai Hivase region that have gone cruelly unacknowledged, mm. um, unknown, and, and the fear is that they will just crumble to dust. We mm. have manuscripts, we have old libraries, rich, full of information, full of historical evidence of the plurality of this region, of the richness of its history and culture. And yet it's just, I, I mean, the manuscripts are just lying there. They, mm. They've not mm. been put in any plastic bag or anything. So I do believe that it, now, it is our responsibility for those who have a link with this region to, to somehow convince those who are in possession of that to come forth and share it with us and so we can help them sort of maintain some form of record. Now, mm. with our very first webinar, which was a quite a successful one, if I may say so myself. We had people from different walks of life who are associated with the language, mm -hmm. not just in Pakistan, but also in India. And one of the things that was acknowledged was that the Saraiki language, real Saraiki, classical Saraiki, if I may, mm -hmm. and Punjabi, they do not have the same roots. They have to be recognized as two different ah. languages. And that's mm. one way of honoring. And then we can start looking at Saraiki literature, Hmm. Whether it's in the form of newspapers or it's in the form of poetry or it's in the hmm. form of Sufiana Kafis or Kalam, whatever it may well be, the idea is to now make it accessible. Now, how hmm. do we go about that? This is where we're going to start. Let's yeah. start a conversation around it first. Let's talk about it. Hmm. Let's convince people, not just Saraiki, but non Saraikis as well, that we're not here, you know, waving our blue Saraiki adjects and saying we're here to take over, but we're actually here to sort of say, all right, this is what we have to offer. Let's sit down and see what we can do about it for the country's betterment. Absolutely. That, that is really important, and especially, and this is something I think about a lot when I'm thinking about culture and I'm thinking about language and we're doing all these shows, is that our particular piece of the world is an area that has such a diverse and rich history that it's detrimental to us to box ourselves into categories, you know, with our own hands, you know, in, in a way like if we have this wonderful, beautiful body of work and culture and writing and poetry that is not Punjabi or it's not Hindko or it's not Sindhi, it, it is what it is on its own. I think that we should be doing everything to preserve as much of everything as we can. Absolutely. And you have to look at the fact that there are different religions that have been part of this region. And there are many texts that allude to that. Yes. So when people talk about a Pakistani identity, I genuinely believe that if you are to create a Pakistani identity, we have to go back to our roots. Yeah. and figure out what it is that defines us and how are we going to own it in its yeah. entirety in order for our future generations to have any sort of future in this country, frankly speaking. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. And again, it's one of those things where pl plurality doesn't have to be threatening. You can have all of those things and we are all so complex and we have a complex and, and again, I feel like div complexity is the sort of, it's, it's a good aspect of diversity. And these are things that we should be able to academically, at least, consider that all of these things can coexist in the same sort of space. There's, I, don't, I don't feel like there has to necessarily be a competition. So Hassan, Tell me, I know that this is also, when we're talking about competition and we're talking about language, a lot of times people tend to think of Saraiki as a dialect of Punjabi. And like Meher was saying, it, it's really not. <laughs> and I, I know that this is something that a lot of people have strong ideas and opinions about. It is. And I think also, Minna, one of the things uh, that I've found over the years that has helped me is educating mm. myself about mm. it. It's one thing to kind of know what I grew up with, with we are yeah. not a dialect, but there's, there's research, hmm. there's actual proof that proves it. So for example, uh, and I'm indebted to my great friend, Hamad Hassan Rind for being so kind and, you know, uh, helping a layman like me out with these terms. One important demarcation between a language and a dialect is a language has a tradition of written literature, ah. which Siraiki does. Hmm. A dialect Absolutely. would not have that. Hmm. 
And if you consider that yardstick, you know, if you look at the long tradition of Sufi poetry in the Siraiki language, yeah. then too much of it is classified as being Punjabi when it is not. Mm. Bulle Shah, for example, mm. writes in Punjabi, uh, in Siraiki. Uh, Sachal Sarmast writes in yes. Siraiki. They wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't a language. Absolutely. The other thing I feel which people uh, often overlook is that, like you said, we have a very diverse part of the world. Mm. We have a lot of uh, people, you know, uh, uh, like we have Baloch tribes in the Siraiki Vasev. We have Sindhi tribes. We have uh, people who have uh, backgrounds from uh, the northern part of the country. Uh, what mm. unites them? The yeah. Siraiki language unites them. Yes. If they see themselves as Siraikis, they mm. are part of one identity. If you fragment them into, oh, but I'd rather be Baloch or I'd rather be Sindhi mm. or I'd rather mm. be, you know, uh, Punjabi or something, yeah. you're, you're, you're getting them away from each other. Siraiki mm. brings them closer. It's a shared mm. language. It's a shared history. It's a shared culture. It's a language that for some researchers goes back literally thousands of years. I yes. mean, they say this is where... Uh, the Vedas was written, this is where the original in the civilization was. Yes. And then it's very difficult at its core. And again, you know, linguists will do a much better job of it than mm -hmm. someone like me. But at its core, Siraiki and Punjabi is just not common. Siraiki has more in common with Sindhi ah. than it does with Punjabi. Mm -hmm. So trying to lump it in just because it's convenient. And I understand that, that we, you know, there is a fear in our country that don't bring up more identities, don't bring up more divisions. Yes, you there know, is our, a great our, anxiety our, there. There is, and our history is littered with the idea somehow that if you, if people think they're Siraiki, they're not Pakistani. Believe me, we're very Pakistani. Uh, yes. You know, the largest diaspora of people working overseas and sending money back is Siraikis. Anywhere you go in the Gulf region, yeah. people working from the guys who are working at the airports to guys who are working mm. in, it's Siraikis and then Patans. Now, the Patans are known because they're very open about their culture. It's very something I relate to because my mom's side is Patan. Hmm. So everybody will talk about it. They're very open. Two Patans meet yeah. each other. Only Pashto is going to be spoken. Yes. They couldn't care less if you don't understand them. Yeah. Siraikis, I think we have this inbuilt thing to feel like, okay, we don't want people to be ostracized. We don't mm. want them to sort of feel like, you know, we're talking about something. So we'll talk in Urdu. Another thing mm. which may might have been detrimental to us, uh, Urdu and over the years, Urdu language and literature has been very valued in the Vaseb. So yes. we take great pride in speaking good Urdu. People yes. like it. But somehow other people think, oh, great, they speak a lot of Urdu, means they don't like speaking their language. Mm. Put three or four Siraikis from the different parts of the Vaseb together. We'll be more than happy to talk to each other in Siraiki. But there is this inbuilt thing that if someone doesn't understand us, is with yes. us who is in Siraiki, let's speak in Urdu or English yes. so they can understand us. Huh. Something you won't find with, with, with our Pathan brethren. They'll be yes. like, if you don't know Pashto, that's your problem. <laughs> Quite right. So this is that openness and that assimilation that people from the Sadaiki Vaseb have done. But then it's also something that seems to have also caused a kind of imbalance in valuing one tradition over another. We're going to take a very quick break and come back to this fascinating conversation. Stay with us. Back in a flash. Welcome back to the coffee table and this fascinating conversation about the Siraiki Vaseb that we have been having with Nawab Hassan Hussain Qureshi, Meher Hussain, and Dr. Nukba Taj Langa. And oh, all the learning. <laughs> having a good time. I know you guys are enjoying this too. <laughs> so Dr. Langa, tell me, as an academic, like with your academic hat on, I was reading about this and there aren't there are only three departments of Siraiki in the whole country, and uh, two of them are in the Siraiki Vaseb. And how do you do you feel like there needs to be more of that? And also like what and also what is the value of translation work when it comes to preserving Saraiki literature? The universities that have uh, Saraiki department are Islamia University Bahawalpur and uh, Bahawalpur City yeah. Sultan. Um, but unfortunately, uh, I mean, there has been a crisis in Bahawalpur Zakriya University because they, they, a few years ago, they received a huge grant to establish mm -hmm. the Raiki Area Study mm -hmm. Center. Right. And you know, that was the time when I had just returned from Britain after completing my PhD. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was in conversation with them about working there or supporting their initiative. 
Yes. So that I I feel recently I have been debating this that this is a big problem hmm. that the language hmm. despite the fact that the language is being taught in universities and in colleges although a lot of Saraiki activists argue that the language uh, uh, th there are uh, lecturer positions for teaching Saraiki for people hmm. who've done MA or MPhil in Saraiki yeah. and there are a lot of posts being created every year That's but good. my argument is yeah. that that what about the language being taught in schools you know mm. if uh, i mean this paradox because if the state in a way the state is accepting the status of a language but the whole discussion around language and dialect debate and not doing any corpus planning of the language mm. not establishing institutions and because just mm. introducing this within the universities all despite the fact that people do, are doing phd research in saraiki mm. mm. uh, mm. Is is a big problem, and yes, because you've got I, because one, you've got this this learning and you've got this degree, but then there's there are not that many avenues in which to then kind of further your work or to teach it or to develop a course and 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 things like that. Hmm. So as far as translation is concerned, um, I mean, in any case, the field of I'm teaching translation studies. you know and also reading theory and i'm i've been translating as well as a yes. practitioner so in any case translation study uh, maintains a second grade status you know okay. as far as the um, academic disciplines are concerned you know it's not given much importance yeah. uh, however a lot of translation has been done as far as saraiki literature is concerned and i i see translation as an act of resistance because it's like carrying forward yeah. uh, bridging yeah. languages bridging cultures so Absolutely. for example hafiz uh, hafiz khan has done translations of fareed um, there's another person i'm forgetting the name kasir shahzad mm. he's done extensive he's transled the diwan e fareed oh. in detail uh, so translation in, in is english or in urdu however the problem is in english so it's very interesting and and interestingly he's not Uh, Sir, I keep speaking himself, but you oh. know, because of his association with yeah. the same, he's been able to do this. He's been posted in Sir, I keep area, and he mm. loves Rohi Cholistan, oh. and you know, so he is inspired by the Sir, I keep language. Yeah. So I think this para we the yeah. at state level, this paradox needs to be uh, we need Address. to overcome it mm. because if there is no harm Address. in teaching a language in their in the schools because. see the whole problem is if our gen next generation or the generations after keep struggling like nawab hasan saab or miss mehr, mehr or myself that how are we, how are we going to preserve our language yep. you know how are our children and next generations yep. are they going to face the same struggle that we are facing mm -hmm. despite being foreign educated mm -hmm. we are mm -hmm. speaking and trying to promote the language Yeah. because we feel that it is so close to our hearts Absolutely. and origins you know mm -hmm. the significance of maboli and ma is so important to us i know so it really I, is i feel mm -hmm. ke, i mean the the way the translations should be done have not been done hmm so it's sort of long a long a long road to go i think but meher you're a parent as as, as am i and as is hasan well i'll tell all of us no but do you feel like this is also and i think that this is a really important point that dr langa has brought up is that we are in a kind of liminal space where we have a maboli we also have uh, you know educations in english we also have Uh, anxieties about the transmission of language like hasan was talking about earlier is about how you know we want our children to do well so we want them to for example learn urdu and learn english at, at home we might be speaking saraiki or punjabi or pashto or whatever it is that we speak at home but then in this kind of tangle then one's mother tongue is the one that's first to be sort of left out So isn't it kind of like a strange paradox where one is trying to conserve it but also trying to you know sort of take the world alongside as well like it it sounds really challenging Absolutely. I think one of the most interesting things to happen with this pandemic is that we we are seeing the end of globalization. What we're seeing is something that the economist refers to as localization. Mm -hmm. People are suddenly looking inwards and they're rediscovering what's happening within their own neighborhoods or regions or communities mm -hmm. or areas. 
And I think our children, the future generation, they are in a unique position where all this activity is happening online, so they'll have access to it. They're a lot more digitally savvy. Mm. And I feel that, yes, on one level, the Maboli, the cultural side of it, the heritage, the legacies of, of, of anything, not just mm. the Saraiki Vestape, but yes. for any um, part of the world, it is sort of... Um, it is a paradox, but on the other hand, I also feel that it's time for us to really look inwards and mm. question our ways of living, our lifestyles, our economic um, decisions, our consumption patterns of culture, of literature, and really think about what are we going to do for the next 50 years or so. Mm. This mm. is the time is now. I cannot emphasize this enough that this is the time for us to act. This is the time when you need to expose your children to whatever it is you want them to know about mm. in the hope that they'll sort of connect with that work and take yeah. it forward in a new innovative mm. manner. Mm. As it is, our children are perpetually bombarded with our indigenous culture, whether it's a gota shilvatvis that they wear or whether it's an ajrak or whether it's a co you know, waistcoat or whatever it is. You have entire industries built on local culture, on indigenous culture, yes. starting from the grassroots level. So our children are immersed in all of that already. But now, they have to have an awareness. That? They have to have an awareness of what it means. Yes. So it's not enough to just kind of be wearing an ajak kurta, but have no sort of sense of who made it, where is it coming from, what kind of centuries old craft does it represent? And all of that is sort of, you know, foundational to having a very strong sense of self and position in the world. You've nailed it. And I think with this pandemic, when we've all been stuck at home, we've had nothing but time. So yes. what are you going to fill that time up with? Yeah. What are yeah. you going to do? And no, uh, how are you going to shape your children's future based on how we are living our lives now, which has come about as a consequence of our decisions? Hmm. Hmm. And I feel like it's something you and I have spoken about before also, specifically with reference to the work that you've done with your fashion book, for example, is that so many traditions and local crafts and ways of doing things are dying out because of this push for modernization and push for industrialization. And, you know, this idea that we have that we have to be this way in order to keep up with the modern world. But if we, this, our generation doesn't hold on to those things, they will be lost forever. Absolutely. They will be lost forever. And I find it highly ironic that we have industries, the capitalist side of, you know, comes in here, that we have industries built on so many things, whether it's the Saraiki um, craft, for example, or whether it's just the, the, the um, Sufi, Sufiana side of it, yeah. or whether it's the exploitation of um, old family names that are used to give gravitas to political movements, mm. whatever it may be, I do feel that there is a national awareness that should by now be in place, given that we this is our second year lockdown, in terms of how we're going to figure out what our future is going to be. Mm. Hmm. And hmm. we need to, and I, and I see it in the younger generation. I mean, I have to say, I'm very hopeful. I look at younger people, especially on digital platforms like Instagram, really standing up and saying, no more. Hmm. I'm going to define what I want my future to be. And it starts with one individual. Hmm. I believe, I genuinely believe in this, that change starts with one person. One person can start and a change reaction will happen. And it's Absolutely. happening already with the podcast and with the yes. archives. So this is something I wanted to sort of quickly, Hassan, come to you with, is that because with the podcast and with your cricket work as well, um, you are in touch with a lot of younger people. And what makes you hopeful for Saraiki Vaseb going into the future with the younger lot? I, I think, Mina, what makes me most hopeful is how they've embraced technology. You know, yeah. they, they've they understood that this is a, an agent for change, as, as Meher rightly said. And they take great pride in, in their language and they take great pride in their history. And they're using it as an opportunity to learn. Mm. So they're learning about mm. it. You know, they're learning about each other. It's really great to see young yeah. female students because we have this perception of the Vaseb as being backward. Why yes. is it backward? Because in people's eyes, you know, there are not enough people in the forefront like Dr. Langa, like, mm. like Meher saying. So it's important that the young girls are also coming in front mm. and they're students, they're student leaders, they're, you know, they're involved in politics. Yeah. And it's, it, it fills me with hope because with my work in cricket, both with 
South Punjab and before, of course, with, with Multan Sultans, the thing that people related with me the most about the fact was when I was at the games in Multan, for them, the biggest happiness was the fact that I was a Multani, you know, yes. that I spoke Siraiki. And that's what they'd come and have a chit chat about. And then when we had our overseas players, we talked to mm -hmm. them a little bit. And I tried to tell them that, right, it's good that people are teaching you ek do teen, but yeah. we need to also do hik do tre huh. because that's what the people relate to. At the end of the day, they relate to their language above all. And I think, you know, you, you asked something about, and Dr. Langar rightly pointed out about teaching it in schools. Hmm. I just feel like, I don't know what happened. I, I think back to my, my late grandfather. He spoke hmm. four languages fluently and he spoke a fifth one very well and he did not have the internet. Yes. You know, <laughs> my father spoke four languages fluently, did not have the internet. I'm struggling my way through three languages. Yeah. So it's not like they had the time or the internet or the other things, but what they did have was the understanding that they need to speak. You know, they understood yes. that, okay, when we live in, uh, we live in Punjab, we work mm. in Punjab, so we know Punjabi, yes. but Siraiki is our language. Mm. English, everybody had to learn at that time. It still mm. retains that thing. And Urdu, they both yes. spoke exceptional Urdu and they prized speaking good Urdu without it ever coming in the way of there being Siraiki. Yeah. For too many of us, the idea this is, you know, is branded about, ke, oh, if they're Siraiki speaking or Punjabi mm. speaking mm. or speaking Balochi at home, they're Pendu, you know, and yes. it's somehow as if it's become no, a bad thing. So, crucial. Mm. It, it, I, and what, what fills me with hope, you know, to come back to your original point is seeing these young people is seeing that they've started channels on YouTube. They've got uh, Twitter spaces going on. So their technology is there. And you're suddenly learning that, you know, there's a guy sitting in, in uh, Muzaffargarh, young guy, 17, 18 years old, who's got a following of people. So that also gives them the opportunity to expand. It gives them the opportunity to see it as a business. Nothing wrong with that. Hmm. And if hmm. the state will not have an interest in teaching it in schools, when enough young people push for it, hmm. they will hmm. have to be an interest created. It just saddens me that so many great schools, so many great places, and yet even in most of our schools here, we're not even teaching uh, Punjabi or, no, we're not. or, or Pashto or yeah. <clears throat> anything of the like, which is yeah. really sad because, Absolutely. you know, no one else is going to do it. And one yes. thing I'd like to point out, mm. Siraiki has a status of a language in India where only about 900,000 people speak it. How? 55 million plus people speak or use Siraiki on a daily basis in Pakistan, in and across the Waseb. Wow. And it does not have that status yet. So mm. I think we need to look at that and we yep. need to understand that this is a very important part of our Pakistani identity. Yes. When you talk about Siraiki, you talk about, you know, Multan, you talk about the Riyasat of Bahalpur, you talk about Dera Ghazi Khan. This is Pakistan. It, in the long term, it only benefits Pakistan. When you have people yeah. who are more proud of their language and more proud of their identity, yes. it's better for Pakistan. So I think that is just a wonderful note to end the show on. Thank you so much, Hassan Meher and Dr. Langa for being with me today. And just, I have learned so much and I am filled with awe and pride to even peripherally be part of such a rich and wonderful tradition. Thank you guys for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you next time on The Coffee Table. Bye.